But when we ended last week, this thing's wobbling on me. When we ended last week, we were in the middle of looking at uh, chapter 5. And as I mentioned, chapter 5 is the first of three large blocks of material in the first nine chapters that address the power and danger of illicit sexual relations. The other two are chapter 6, verses 20 to 35, and chapter 7. So you have three large blocks, 5, the end of 6, 7, that address this question. You have this earlier warning in chapter 2, verses 16 to 19, and that emphasis ought to tell us It ought to tell us that illicit sexual relationships pose a tremendous danger to a good life. It is a very large trap that takes one from a good life. I know it doesn't look that way. I know our culture doesn't say that. But that's why we're studying Proverbs. The wisdom of God is saying this is a very large trap. And that's why it's so emphasized. I want to quickly read the chapter again and then I'll recap some of what I said last week and then we'll go on from there so he says my son be attentive to my wisdom incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil but in the end she is bitter as wormwood sharp as a two-edged sword Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander and she does not know it. And now, O sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Lest you give your honor to others and your ears to the, and your years, ears, that's funny, and your years to the merciless lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed and you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Drink water from your own cistern flowing water from your own well should your springs be scattered abroad streams of water in the streets let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth a lovely deer a graceful doe let her breast fill you at all times with delight be intoxicated always in her love why should you be intoxicated my son with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. So here we have, uh, let me just give you a little bit, remind you what what I said last week, and then we'll we'll pick up and, and talk about that. After getting his son's attention, he does that repeatedly in Proverbs when he's getting ready to do teaching, he'll he'll get the son's attention. He tells him to listen up for his own benefit, and then he warns the son not to get sexually involved with an immoral woman, one with whom or to whom he has no right of sexual relationship. She's nothing but bad news. I know how it will appear. That's why you have to warn your children, your sons in particular. That she's nothing but bad news. Now the pull for young men is so powerful that he says in verse 8 that the son is not even to go near the woman. You say, well, that seems like overkill. No, the pull is that great that he's not even to go near. And then in verses 9 through 14, he enumerates some of the negative consequences of getting involved with her. And that's where we ended last week. See, one's honor and respect within the community will be squandered and the years of building one's reputation will be put in the hands of, will be given over to somebody who will take vengeful delight in destroying it by exposing one's deeds. 
So here you are, you've spent years building a reputation, you get pulled into this immoral sexual relationship, and you are giving all of those years of building your reputation into the hands of somebody who will take vengeful delight in destroying what you've built through years. By exposing your deeds and saying, look at this person. Look what this person has done. In fact, I was just, Meg was pointed out to me there was an article yesterday on Peyton Manning and it's all about something many years ago that he was allegedly involved in and I say it's a little bit different situation but I just say you see how, so what's that the the effect of is what is to if this story sticks is to destroy a reputation that he spent a long time building and so you see that principle there Verse 10 seems to point to the possibility of, of one being financially exploited or ruined by people associated with the woman, extorting the adulterer, perhaps blackmail. You see, when you go in and you engage in this behavior, well, now you're what? Vulnerable to this. And so you wind up giving your property over to them. Verses 11 to 14, they portray the, the regret that one will feel at the end of one's life for having foolishly ignored the instruction to stay away from such a woman. Here you're being told, being explicitly told over and over again, you are to stay away from such a woman, and when you don't do it, and at the end there's going to be this tremendous regret, and part of it's going to be that you did not heed the instruction that was given to you. You had every opportunity. You had the voice of wisdom speaking to you. You chose to blow it off and now you're suffering the consequences of having done that. And you see that there in 1114. The physical pleasure of the sexual relationship will be nothing in light of the bitterness of the wormwood and the wounds of the double-edged sword. That he, that's how he described the woman. Wormwood and a double-edged sword dangerous stuff now in verses 15 to 19 verses 15 to 19 the father urges the son to maintain a vital sexual relationship with his wife as a defense to sexual temptation you see paul says essentially the same thing in first corinthians chapter 7 verses 3 through 5 in verse 15, he tells the son to find sexual fulfillment in his own wife, referred to by images of a well and a cistern. Your own well. Okay, I think you get the imagery, right? So he says that in your own, you're to find satisfaction in your own well and cistern rather than with another woman. And the point of verse 16 is that the son should not be sleeping around. He should restrict his springs and his streams of water to his wife. And that's reinforced in verse 17 from a strictly practical angle. See, his sexual energy and his sexual vigor should be used for his own benefit in the sense of building up his own family rather than impregnating women in other families. So it simply reinforces this idea that you are not to be sleeping around. You are to focus your sexual energy and attention on your wife. And then he just gives that practical thing about because that builds up your family, not the family of someone else. The son is to let his fountain be blessed, meaning with children, with progeny by having sexual relations only with his wife. And toward that end, he's instructed to rejoice in the wife of his youth. That's verse 18. She is to remain the focus of his sexual interest. Verse 19. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Verse 18. The wife of your youth. 19, be intoxicated always in her love. Now let me ask you, what do you think pornography does toward that? Here we are being instructed in wisdom that you are to maintain a vital sexual relationship with your wife as a prevention to sexual temptation. 
and you are to focus on her and the, the wisdom is that's what the wisdom teacher is telling us. And what do you think pornography does to your ability to focus your sexual energy on your wife? Do you think it helps that? Where you're sitting here seeing naked women, all kinds of women, doing different things? All phony acting junk? Do you think that helps you focus and restrict your sexual energy and focus on the wife of your youth? Or do you think it harms? Of course it harms that. Of course it harms that. So there are many reasons why that's an evil. But that's one of them. It makes you dissatisfied with the one person, the wife of your youth. It works against that and that then in turn works against your ability to withstand sexual temptation. So here we have the wise man a uh, father t explaining to the, his son uh, that this is something that, that, that he needs to focus and keep his sexual focus on his wife. And you can say, well, that would work the other way. Yes, it would work the other way, but there's an asymmetry here in the sexual pull. Okay, you have to understand that, ladies. The focus there, yes, should a woman be focused? Yes, a woman's focused on her husband, but the wise teacher is focusing on the son and it's not just be, men are pulled by this. I mean, I, I don't even feel like I should have to say that. People who've lived in this world ought to understand that. Men get trapped in this really easily. And so this is a, a, a tremendous word to the wise. In verses 20 to 23, the father urges the son to sexual fidelity on the basis that God is aware of all of man's ways, even the things done in secret. He's aware of all of it. There are no, you, you, you can't go get off with uh, somebody else's wife, for example, and you guys, you know, the no-tell motel, what goes in Vegas stays in Vegas, and all of this nonsense. And you think God doesn't know what's going on? Do you think he doesn't see what you're doing? And that's what he's saying in verses 20 to 23. He will hold the person accountable he knows what's going on he sees it and he will hold the person accountable for sexual immorality Hebrews 13 4 says the marriage bed is to be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterer so it's not it's not just the wise teacher New Testament Old Testament this is something here that you see now we get into in in chapter 6 we begin these wisdom admonitions, and he says, My son, if you've put up security for your neighbor, have given your pledge for a stranger. In other words, if you've agreed to stand good for your stra a stranger's debt, one outside the community, to a neighbor, to one inside the community, if you're snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself for you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go hasten and plead urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Now the situation that's addressed in verse 1 is not entirely clear, but I think what's being described here, it's the case where one has rashly agreed perhaps to impress the community, to stand good for the debt of a stranger to someone in the community. Someone has shot his mouth off, whether to appear to be a big shot to the neighbors, to appear to be rolling in dough that this doesn't bother me, or just to appear to them to be magnanimous and has agreed to stand good for the debt of a stranger to one of the neighbors when he can't afford it. He cannot afford to do that. But because presumably he wanted to impress someone, he made that wrong decision, shot his mouth off and made that rash commitment. Now the implication is, of course, that you should not make such a rash commitment. But the advice goes to the situation of somebody who's already made it. Somebody who has already made the rash commitment and got into a position that they are now in financial jeopardy because of it. 
Well, what is the advice that is given? Well, as David Hubbard says, the lesson then is swallow hard and eat your humble pie. He adds, he goes on and he says, in a society where pride and self-esteem governed public conduct and made apology rare and groveling before a creditor even more rare, this lesson would have cut to the quick. It called for admitting a faux pas, reneging on a promise, and badgering a powerful neighbor for relief from it, distasteful but necessary, and a wholesome reminder that prudence would have avoided the predicament in the first place. It was not a brother or uncle for whom he rashly pledged collateral and co-signed an agreement. It was someone to whom he had no primary obligation and who in turn was not at all accountable to him. So this, is, this looks like this is the circumstance where the person has done this for whatever reason. I'm smelling impressing somebody. Put himself in financial jeopardy and is now caught by that foolish commitment. And so he says here that the solution is you're going to just have to eat humble pie. And the larger lesson is that when you make a foolish commitment to someone who has a moral right to free you from that commitment. In other words, that if you get that person to say you are released, then you can withhold the, obli- the, the promise without any wrongdoing in other words if I get the person who has a moral right to free me and I go and beg him and he says okay you're released well then I'm released so this larger thing is 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 that if you make a foolish commitment to somebody who has a moral right to free you from that commitment don't let your pride and your ego keep you from seeking that person's mercy and I think that applies pretty broadly sometimes we get caught in a situation that we haven't been wise about and the only solution is we have to eat crow or humble pie and go and ask for mercy and ask that person to release us and it's better to take the the medicine of humiliation than to suffer ruin for the sake of pride now that's a lesson if you can understand that and so he he's telling him this is how do you live skillfully in this world that God created this is part of it is that if you find yourself in that situation, you need to extricate yourself by going to the person who has the moral right to free you and humbling yourself and seeking that person's mercy. I'm not going to do that. Well, then you're going to suffer. I'm not going to anybody. Okay, I'm just telling you. You can accept the wisdom or not, but you don't do it, and you're facing ruin. Now, this teaching is not, of course, intended to discourage being generous to the poor. Not at all. I mean, how could it when you have like Proverbs 28, 27 says, Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. You know, I think of the rich man and Lazarus. This rich guy had to be stepping over this guy all the time going, What? What? I'm not looking. I'm not looking. You see, so it's not about that. It's not discouraging being generous to the poor. It's talking about a larger lesson of being willing to humble yourself when you've made a commitment that was foolish and someone has the moral right to free you. You need to go ahead and, and do that. Then we have a warning in 6, 6 through 11, a warning against laziness. This will appear again and again. He says, go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest? And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. The sluggard is told to learn from the behavior of ants kind of interesting told to learn from the behavior of ants and the point about them having no ruler or authority structures is that they labor diligently without them you see they have no ruler they have no authority structures and yet how do they conduct themselves they labor diligently despite the fact they don't have that authority or that that authority structure or rulers see they illustrate the self-motivated worker in contrast to the lazy person who will work 
only under compulsion from an authority figure. The lazy person will not work of his own initiative. He's only going to work when he has to, when he's responsible, you know, somebody's over him riding him. When he has somebody to whom he's accountable who makes him do that, if he can get away with it, meaning if there's no authority to hold him accountable, the sluggard will not work. Just won't do it. Now, if a person is unwilling to work hard, if a person is unwilling to be industrious, he can expect a life of poverty and want. If you can communicate this to your children, you are blessing them. And it's getting harder and harder, it seems to me. The idea that there's no such thing as want and poverty coming on somebody because they are lazy. Not everybody who is in a situation of want and poverty is lazy. But the proverb is true. <laughs> If you are lazy, then you can look for poverty and want. It's not law. Are there some lazy people? Yes, yes, I know that. We talked about how proverbs function. But being industrious is a tool of living. Being willing to work hard is something that is important. And here he's instilling this in the, in the person's, uh, his son's life. See, the sluggard foolishly chooses the immediate momentary pleasure of rest I don't want to work why should I work and what this leads to all kinds of things by the way it leads to, leads to criminal activity where I don't think I should have to work to do anything everybody else I'm looking around they got stuff I don't want to work but I want stuff well, what does that equal that equals I'm gonna take somebody's stuff you see I don't want to do that I don't want to work workings for chumps all right, well, th this is not the way to live and be successful in life. Oh, that's old stuff. I don't care what you call it. It is wisdom from God. And it is true and right. And it is important to instill in people. But they take this momentary pleasure of rest over the far greater reward that diligent labor produces. They are short-sighted. I'm tired, I just want to, no, be industrious, be diligent, work hard, and your life will be better for it and you'll be blessed. I don't care if that's in school, I don't care if that's in employment, I don't care where it is, what it is. Sports, you go talk to anybody who excels in any sport, and you find out what they do. Well, LeBron James, he just has this majestic body. He does, whatever he is, 6'8", 6'7", 250, 260, jump out of the gym do you think he hasn't worked to hone his skill you're crazy nobody succeeds like that without working okay so anyway in all facets of life here's some other topics he deals with 6 uh, 12 to 19 a worthless person a wicked man goes about with crooked speech winks with his eyes signals with his feet points with his finger with perverted heart devises evil continually sowing discord Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, really to his soul. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers." Verses 12 to 14, they describe uh, the wicked person as one whose mouth or speech is crooked, meaning he utters lies and slander. That's what's behind this idea of crooked speech. He utters lies and slander and what describes the wicked man as one who employs secretive, scheming gestures. You see, there's no need for these kind of, you know, these kinds of gestures. If I'm out in the open with what I'm doing, it's when I'm you know, on the move and trying to hide and scheme that I need to do these things, signals with his feet, points with his finger. He employs those kinds of things. He has a perverse heart, one that's bent on evil, and he creates discord in the community. However things may look, as you and I look on the landscape 
And you look at a person like this and you say, well, he seems to be getting along well. However things may look, verse 15 makes plain that their ultimate end is irreversible disaster. The ultimate end of this wicked person, described this way, is irreversible disaster. Verses 16 to 19, they refer to, to seven things that the Lord absolutely despises. As Tremper Longman in his commentary, he notes that it's hard to imagine a more definitive way to express God's displeasure than with the sayings, he hates these things and they are an abomination to his soul. Now this literary device that he uses, known as a numerical ladder, where he gives a certain number, then he gives that number plus one, there are six things, seven things. You see, that, uh, that literary device of a numerical ladder is generally understood by scholars to mean that the number given doesn't exhaust the list. There are other things that qualify, but are not being included, okay? But you still have to focus on what is he talking about. He refers to first haughty eyes. This is a reference to pride, right? Haughty eyes, this idea that I look down on everybody, you're not in my league, you're not, you know, I'm like the cat's pajamas. Oh man, I'm, you know, I'm just so, everybody else is just so below me. You see? That's just, that's just a way of speaking about pride, and God hates pride. Now there is a kind of pride. Annie Mae Lewis used to say, I'm proud of you in a good way. You see, so there, I think there is room for, there is a sense of pride like in, in achievement or doing something, working hard and doing something. You know the pride I'm talking about here, this pride of, of having this overblown sense of one's importance and this image of, of yourself. And prideful people, not only are they wrong for having that attitude, but they wallow in wrongdoing because pride keeps them from seeing themselves honestly. They have such an inflated view of themselves and see themselves as so much greater than everybody, they are not open to any perception or word that, that challenges them and would help benefit them and make them better. Because they just, they wall that off because they have in their pride, they've created this thing that I'm impervious to criticism. You can't do anything to me because I'm that cool. I'm that great. And so they wind up wallowing in wrongdoing as a side effect of their pride. He speaks of a lying tongue. Well, that obviously refers to those who lie. And I got to say, we tend to make light of lying. Our society is just like lying, just like part of it, right? But no, lying is wrong. Lying is sinful. It is not the way to live, and it's something that God absolutely hates. Politicians have made an art form out of it. And it just, no, nobody cares anymore. You know, there was a time when somebody was a liar. Well, that was considered, you know, that's something. That's, that's a mark on your character. But that's just, everybody lies. You know, just, we, you know, just question, we're just talking about levels. You know, everybody lies. And this is the thing, God hates it, and we need to understand that. Hands that shed innocent blood refers to those who murder human beings. And we say, well, you know, that's not a terrible problem for us. But let me remind you that since 1973, 55 million unborn children have been aborted in this country. Since 1973, between 1973 and 2014, 55 million in America, let alone the rest of the world, 55 million unborn children have been slaughtered. Okay? So this is very relevant. There is no more innocent blood than the blood of unborn children. And the church, it seems to me, is afraid of speaking out boldly. We've left this to the Catholics. We're afraid of speaking out boldly because somebody has said this is political. I don't care what label is hung on it. It is killing, and it is not right. Are you saying that, you know, there's no hope for people? I'm not saying that at all. I understand that the well of God's mercy is open for all. That's not the question. The question is, will we stand with a strong voice and condemn in this country and in the world the killing of innocent babies? This is a no-brainer to me. Will we do it? 
Oh, yeah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to make somebody feel bad. I don't want to make anybody feel bad gratuitously. But if somebody's been engaged in it, they need to repent of it. Okay? So this idea about, you know, shedding innocent blood, God, God hates it. He speaks of a heart that devises wicked plans. Well, that refers to those who pervert God-given intellect and creativity. He's given us intellect. He's given us creativity. And then we pervert that into tools of evil. We use that to devise ways of doing wrong. God hates that. He hates that. Feet that hasten to run to evil refers to those who are eager to act on their evil impulses. They can't get down to wrongdoing fast enough. This is what they want to do. They want to just run to get down to it. They enjoy it. They're eager to it. It seems to be the way to go. God hates that. A false witness. This is a more specific manifestation of a lying tongue. It's somebody who testifies falsely against someone else. You have this happen. You have, I was just thinking yesterday, you have situations where people falsely accuse people of rape, for example. Just come out and say, yeah, no, this, this guy, it, it, this is a horrible thing to do to people. Get up here and perjure themselves. And do this kind of stuff to destroy people. It's a terrible thing and God hates it. One who sows discord among brothers, that's one who disturbs harmony within a family and the application to the church is painfully clear, is it not? There are people who seem to get off on creating problems in communities, in families, in groups. They seem to like to stir up trouble and pit people against one another. I, I don't know if it's some psychological thing or what. But God hates it. We are not to be about sowing discord. Did you hear this? Did you know that? Did you do this? Go over and talk to this woman. They said this. And you stand back and watch this. Isn't that funny? It's demonic. It's demonic. God hates it. Okay? He can't be clearer about it. Chapter 6, 20 to 35. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you wake, they will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. To preserve you from the evil woman. From the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. And do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can, can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he's hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor and his disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious and he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation. He will refuse multiply gifts and here in verses 20 to 22 the father tells the son to keep the father's command and not to forsake his mother's teaching so you see that the wisdom that the father is conveying to the son is that of both parents he's the one doing the teaching but his the mother is wise, and the father is wise, and the father is conveying to the sons the teaching of both. His command, her teaching. So it's the, these wise parents trying to bless their children in their upbringing. So it, it's, it's of both parents. Now the son is to internal, internalize the command and the teaching, and he will be benefited constantly in so doing. They will lead him when he's active. The command and the teaching will protect him when he's lying down. And they will get his attention when he first awakens. And the father says in verses 23 and 24 that his command and his mother's teaching 
are sources of light. And that disciplined correction is the way of life. They're sources of light and disciplined correction is the way of life that can protect the son from the danger of the adulteress. Again, we have this. From the danger of the adulteress. Now, as I've said, the fact the sage speaks so often of sexual temptation and does so with with such forceful rhetoric, it shows the power and the danger of the temptation. It's like, how, how strongly do I have to emphasize this to you before you, young man, understand that this is serious mojo? I want you to be tuned into that. So when you're, you're close, you're, you're alert. Because if you're not alert, you're going to get in trouble. And he wants them to understand that. Now, note that the son is first warned about the adulteress's flattering speech. About her flattering speech. As Longman writes, he says, this comment shows psychological insight. The sage is aware that men falter not always for the obvious reasons of beauty, but also because of an appeal to self-vanity. And I've mentioned this before, but this is certainly true. You see that when you pump up a man's ego, it is a way to draw closer to him. You see, he starts to feel good because you're feeding his ego. And so here is this man, and here is this adulteress who comes up to him, and she's speaking, as I said before, and she's saying, you know, my husband, he just doesn't understand me. I mean, you know, he's not like you. Oh, you're so, you listen so well, and you're so generous and kind. He's just crabby and all these things. Well, what is that doing to you? You see, that's blowing up your ego, and you have to be on guard because we are vulnerable to that. And this is what the wise man is saying to his son. He wants his son to know, I'm vulnerable to this. So I have to be on guard against it. In verse 25 and 26, the father warns the son not to be captivated by the married woman's beauty. This is just powerful. You see, he says, don't be captivated by that. It's, a, it's going to be a temptation, son. I'm telling you right now, before the circumstance arrives, so you can internalize this and be on guard. He says, don't be captivated by the married woman's beauty. Whereas a prostitute will take your things, a loaf of bread, she takes stuff, money. You see, a married woman hunts down a man's life. In the sense that having a sexual relationship her, with her may well lead to death at the hands of her husband. See, the prostitute take your stuff. You're having sex with some guy's wife. And that's going to hunt your life because her husband may kill you. Or insist on your being killed. Now the point of 27 and 29 is that just, just as one can expect to be burned... By carrying fire next to one's chest or by walking on hot coals. So a man who's sexually intimate with another person's wife can expect to be harmed. I had, probably two months ago, maybe a month ago, I had some guy call me from another state who had committed adultery with a woman. They subsequently got married, you know, her marriage was through and all this kind of stuff. And he told me about how it had tormented him. And I'm just thinking, yeah, you see, living, living this way produces this. And this was years ago. It produces these things. You get burned. Verses 30 to 35, they emphasize the danger of adultery by contrasting it to a thief who steals to satisfy his hunger. See, this is the contrast with adultery. People are not morally outraged at such a thief. The thief does have to pay a fine, has to pay back seven times the value of what he stole, but people are not morally outraged at a thief. The adulterer, on the other hand, will be disgraced and will suffer wrath, the wrath of the jealous husband, who will accept no monetary fine in substitution for the death penalty. 
Because this is personal, as we would say. You intrude into a marriage relationship. It is, first of all, an outrage. But it is personal. And the husband will not accept a fine instead of the death penalty. Here's what Longman says. The logic of verses 34b and 35 depends on the nicety of Hebrew law. The penalty for adultery is death for both the man and the woman, Deuteronomy 22.22. However, technically, it would be possible to substitute a monetary fine in place of the death penalty. This can be gathered from Numbers 35, verses 31 and 32, which states that a ransom, a fine, cannot be substituted for murder. Okay, the implication being that it can be substituted for the other things. He says the implication is that other capital offenses can be commuted into monetary fines. Furthermore, the Goring Ox Law also provides for such a substitution at Exodus 21.30. It is not clear who can demand such a substitution, but likely the victim in the case of adultery, the offended husband, who would be involved in the decision. This implication makes sense of our present passage, which implies that the husband's jealousy would be such that he would refuse any suggestion to commute the death penalty. I think that's what the wisdom teacher is getting at. He's saying, listen, you go and you be immoral with a prostitute, there is one price to be paid. You see, yes, you're doing wrong. You are giving up a loaf of bread. She will demand your things. God is not pleased with you. But she's going to demand your things. But you go and sleep with somebody's spouse. And you've entered into another realm. You see, you've entered into, and and talking to the son, he says, you go and do that. And the prostitute will cost you stuff. Doing this is going to, she will hunt down a man's life. And I think that's what she's at, that's what's being said here. It has tremendous ramifications. It's a terrible thing. But it also has these things and it is unwise. And the point is trying to communicate. If you want to live well in this world, listen to me. See, the father is saying, and the woman wisdom will say, listen to me. That is not the way to go. I know what the world will say. I heard that bell. I know what the word the world will say. But I'm telling you, listen to me and your life will be blessed. Thanks for coming.